be feeling is going through all types of physical and mental torture. But that's all right, because we said even before this happened, and we're going to say it after this, and after I'm locked up, and after everybody's locked up, that you can jail a revolutionary, but you can't jail a revolution. Right. You might run a liberator like Eric Cleave out the country, but you can't run liberation out the country. You might murder a freedom fighter like Bobby Hutton, but you can't murder freedom fighting. And if you do, you come up with answers that don't answer explanations that don't explain. You come up with conclusions that don't conclude. And you come up with people that you thought should be acting like pigs, just acting like people and moving on pigs. And that's what we've got to do. So we're going to see about Bobby, regardless of what these people think we should do. Because school is not important and work is not important. Nothing's more important than stopping fascism because fascism will stop us all. That was the voice of Fred Hampton, who was the chairman for the Illinois chapter of the Black Panthers and also the founder of the Rainbow Coalition. You can see a depiction of him and his story in the recently released film, Judas and the Black Messiah. Today, we're going to talk about the Black Panthers and the context for Fred Hampton's life and the other influencers that arose out of that community. There is a TED Talk by Curtis Austin. I recommend that you all begin with. It's called Black Panthers, White Lies. And Curtis opens with a story that I'll, I'll, I'll leave to him to be able to tell in detail, but essentially the story involved him being pulled over and questioned by the FBI merely because he had several copies of a book that he wrote about the Black Panthers. And one of the things that he says in that talk is that there's so much misinformation surrounding this group. There are so many bad optics surrounding this group and their history that for him to even travel with multiple books, multiple copies of the same book about them, in an effort to give them away, that that was something that made him look suspicious and warranted being detained by the FBI. So for those of you who have not seen our last conversation, Vanguard of the Revolution Part 1, where we talked about the optics of ideas, I encourage you to pause, go back and listen to that because it provides a lot of context for a lot of the things that we say here. One of the things we believe at the Revolution of One is that the enemy is violence, and the solution is voluntarism. The enemy is coercion and the solution is creativity. And the greatest revolutions are the revolutions that we can create through our own personal development, our own spiritual practice, our own self-actualization. And we study revolutionaries and past revolutions with an aim of trying to understand the concerns that were underneath it and trying to figure out what are things we can learn about the successes and the failures, the questions, the concerns, the challenges of past revolutions? And today we're going to be talking about the vanguard of the revolution, the Black Panthers, and it's influenced by a documentary of the same title, Vanguard of the Revolution. I, I want to begin by quoting Fred, uh, Fred Hampton here because I think it's very important to lead strongly with something that contradicts the optics. When people hear Black Panther, they think, oh, that's the group that, that hated white people, right? Oh, that's the group of black nationalists, black separatists who were all pro-black and um, you know denigrated everyone else, right? So I wanna start with something that Fred Hampton himself said. He said, white power to white people, yellow power to yellow people, brown power to brown people, black power to black people, all power to all people. There's lots of room for discussion and debate about what they got right, what they got wrong, even amongst members and former members of the Black Panthers themselves. But if there's anything that characterized their vision, it was about bringing power to the people without discrimination. And we talked about Malcolm X in a previous episode. We, gave, we dedicated a full episode to Malcolm, but in part one, we talked about Malcolm X and those three pillars of individual liberty, the individual right, uh, the individual responsibility for self-sufficiency, the individual responsibility for self-education, and the individual right to self-defense. When Malcolm X was assassinated, there arose a deep concern about self-defense and self-protection, which is why the name of the Black Panther Party in full was the Black 
Panther Party for Self-Defense. The Black Panthers arose in response to violence that was being enacted against African-Americans. And they initially came into existence with the effort of reducing the amount of intimidation and violence that was happening against Black folks. And it evolved into so much more. And we're going to dive into it. So I want to say a couple quick, of oh, in, oh. In, into the name, uh, you know, one of the things that I found interesting after watching the documentary was that they actually chose the 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 panther as their icon very intentionally uh they did some research into different kind of animals and the panther specifically uh when in situations of confrontations of situations of battle uh the panther um instinctively first backs up when approached by an aggressor um it, it first takes a few steps back but after the aggressor pursues it then retaliates so i think you know that that was a symbol of you know what they stood for and how they wanted to carry their group is that they're, they're not the groups that are uh trying to strike first that are trying to initiate uh violence but um you know as any big tiger is they're a force to be reckoned with uh once they are in the midst of battle 100%. So uh, one of the, the co-founders, uh, Huey P. Newton, one of the things that he was notorious for having done was just studied all of the gun laws. And the brother had it down so well that he could quote it back to you. I mean, this guy was like reciting gun laws to police officers that they themselves didn't even know, or typically didn't even, you know, have to know to perform their job. But Huey P. Newton knew the laws better than a lot of the lawmakers themselves. And so when they had their, their cop watch program, one of the things they would do is whenever there was a pullover, um, they would display their guns visibly and they would just stand there. And the mindset was, we want to look like a presence that ought to be taken seriously because we're not here to initiate any violence. We're here to hold you accountable to making sure you do everything by the book. And we have studied the books, we've memorized the books, and we know what you're supposed to do. These guys weren't out there just protesting after the fact. They were making themselves present in the midst of the fact. And there were a lot of people that supported them and, and they had a lot of people who were around. So I, I, I talked a little bit about Huey, Huey P. Newton, but the, one of the other co-founders, Bobby Seale, has a quote that I think captures their, their mission and, and their vision very well. And I wanna read that to you here and show it. The Black Panther Party was a revolutionary political organization. Although its members were leaders of the Black Power Movement, they were not Black nationalists. Their Black pride was not based on denigrating whites, but on showing the Black community how to take control of its own destiny. The Black Panther Party worked for economic justice and power for all people. This is very similar to Malcolm X's ideas, and you can see the influence there in this quote from Bobby Seale. Malcolm X, is, you know, I remember when I was in grade school, and I, I was in an all-white grade school, and I was first reading a copy of Alex Haley's autobiography of Malcolm X, and, and, and one of the kids sitting next to me said, why would you want to read a book by a person that hated white people? Mm. And I had no defense for that, because I hadn't read the book yet. <laughs> and obviously, Obviously, the kids sitting next to me hadn't read it either, because once I finished reading the book, I realized, oh, my gosh, um, you know, um, arguably, this guy was killed because his view of life um, threatened to unite people and bring them together and cause them to work together in order to help people um, increase the amount of individual liberty they had. But Malcolm X was was very big on the importance of understanding that, hey, when I say we got to build up ourselves and build up our own communities, that's not a value judgment that tells us to hate other people and to arbitrarily inflict violence on other people. That's a philosophy that says we got to love ourselves. We got to respect ourselves. We got to build ourselves. Um, and that's that's what Bobby Seale had to say here. Another quote by Fred Hampton again, which I think sets the tone really well, is we've got to face the fact that some people say you fight fire best with fire but we say you put fire out best with water. We say you don't fight racism with racism. We're gonna fight racism with solidarity. 
one of the things that was so interesting about the Vanguard of the Revolution documentary is you see at least what was to me a surprising amount of white people that stood by these guys that marched alongside them, that attended their information sessions, that volunteered with them. And when they were framed or, or legally accosted and, and dealt with unjustly, people were standing outside of the courtrooms protesting, saying, you gotta let these brothers out of here, this isn't right. Seeing it through to the end, and one of the things that was pointed out by, you know, by the documentary is that they were threatening at that time, not because they were a group of black folks just hanging out with other black folks. They were threatened because there were lots of white people paying attention saying, wait a minute, these guys are saying some interesting stuff. These guys have some legitimate gripes and these guys are just trying to raise money to build up their own communities and get people to take more responsibility for their own self-sufficiency and self-defense. And so um, that that was kind of an interesting thing to me just to lead with the Black Panthers. So I wanted to lead with those two quotes capturing the vision and just a little info on that. Yeah, I think there, as we pointed out in, in part one of this conversation, is that there's uh, an important distinction that, you know, at Revolution, we of one we make uh that you can interact with ideas and with people who say ideas and with groups who stand for ideas without fully uh committing your loyalty unto that group that cause that person um and and that's the purpose of this conversation because there there are things that the black panthers stood for uh that i'd like to share with the audience for for you to uh, engage and to interact to see if it does fall <clears throat> in line with your your personal philosophy and then a lot of the stuff we preach but there are other things um that are i think a lot of people who you know supported the black panther party might not reign true with a lot of the things that we talk about um and so one of the things specifically, you know, TK started off by talking about like this group of yeah. the Black Panthers. And I think two of the things um, that, you know, have a lot of controversy is that they fought against white supremacy and then uh, they were not advocates of capitalism. And there's a Fred Hampton quote that I wanted to read um, that, that talked about capitalism specifically. There's a man called a capitalist don't matter what color he is, black, white, brown, red, don't matter, because the capitalist has one goal, and that is to exploit the people. He can have on a three-piece suit or a dashiki, because political power doesn't flow from the sleeve of a dashiki. Political power flows from the barrel of a gun. And I thought that this was an interesting, um, you know, an interesting thought about capitalism, because what TK articulated in some of his quotes was that Black Panthers really started becoming a force to be reckoned with when they were united in people that were not just Black, um, you know, that were Latino, that were white, um, that were, you know, deriving from different communities and different races. Um, but, and, and it's interesting to hear him on the other side of this talking about, you know, not being an advocate for capitalism and mentioning that capitalists can be black, that they can be white, that they can, you know, be red, they can be whatever color, uh, that does not necessarily mean that, you know, or that means that we're not endorsing them just because they're whatever color. So it, it I think it, it speaks to the point that they were not just a black nationalist organization, um, but really that they had values uh, that were either in line with what they believed or not in line with what they believe. So I wanted to give TK an opportunity like to comment on that because that that that's kind of a big point that I think uh you know people maybe from our audience or just in general, you know, because um they might not have they didn't stand for capitalism, you know, is there still stuff to be learned and and what does that even mean that they didn't stand for capitalism? Hey, man, I'm an equal opportunity educator. And, you know, just as I tell people who are anti-capitalists that they should read books on capitalism and that they should give fair treatment to the arguments, I would say the same thing to capitalists. I think capitalists 
need to spend more time engaging the ideas of anti-capitalists in order to learn um, more about the essence of those criticisms. So for instance, let, let's take a look at what Fred Hampton had to say. He talked about how power proceeds from the barrel of the gun and political power in particular. And I agree with him. Larry Sharp, when he was on our show last season, and he talked about legislation, one of the things that he explained so well is that anytime you say you want to solve a problem legislatively, what you mean is you endorse the use of violence towards the end of making that happen. So if I don't like something that you do and it bothers me and I want to make it illegal, then what I'm really advocating for is that a gun be put to you if you ever refuse to stop doing that thing. It's to say I'm okay with that. And we're so many steps removed from the ugly reality of that process that it can be very easy for us to get legislation happy and to advocate for a law as the solution to everything that bothers us or concerns us about the way other individuals use their freedom. And so legislation is a form of coercion and everything that the state does, it does it coercively. The state does not create, the state does all that it does coercively. Even in terms of money, the state does not create any wealth. The state does not have a resource that it sells. It does not generate wealth on its own. It has to forcibly extract wealth from the citizenry. Now, you can make your arguments for why you think that's justified or for why you don't think that's justified, but one thing that we cannot debate is that coercion is the way that it happens. We just have differences between different groups of people regarding the legitimacy of coercion or the degree to which it should or should not be allowed. So when Fred Hampton talks about the barrel of the gun and the role that it plays in political power, he's absolutely right about violence here. And what a lot of critics of capitalism rightly point out is that much of what gets called capitalism today is really what can be called corporatism or crony capitalism. It is the merging of private interests with political violence. And there are many people who are happy to endorse the principles of capitalism when they are creating wealth. But the moment they get into these positions of wealth and power, and they want to insulate themselves from the threat of competition, from the challenge of accountability. They get in bed with government and they say, hey, let's use legislation towards our advantage. And, 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 and they can often afford to be able to hire people full time to figure out ways to exploit the law in a way that produces advantages for them that their less wealthy, less powerful counterparts would have a difficult time overcoming. And I think for Fred Hampton to point that out is a legit gripe. It's a legit concern. Now, I don't want to put words in his mouth and say, hey, you know, in his heart, sure. the brother was really a capitalist and he would agree <laughs> with everything that I'm saying. No, I don't want to assume that about him. I mean, he could speak for himself far better than I can speak, period. I mean, that brother was 20 years old when he gave that speech. You know what I mean? Like this brother delivered historical speeches at 20 and I'm still trying to learn how to talk like that. So I, I don't dare speak for him. But one of the reasons I stopped using the word capitalism, or at least I try to stop using it, and I, you know, I, I try to speak in terms of being a non-interventionist or in terms of being a free market voluntarist, because I'm really about economic flourishing. I'm about equality of opportunity. I'm about the elimination of artificial monopoly. I'm about the, the elimination of artificially restricting people's ability to create and to cooperate. I'm about eliminating artificially restricting people's ability to opt out of things that they don't want to do. Um, and I think that's how you restore power to the people. And Fred Hampton was really about power to the people. And like any revolutionary, he was critiquing the system of his time. And if you look at the economic system of his time, that was not a free market system that he was creating. <laughs> I mean, anytime you've got an economic system where segregation is not voluntary, but it is backed by the, the force of the government, then, I mean, you don't have a free market. A free market would sort that out in an entirely different way. A free market would allow black folks to say, hey, you don't like us? All right, well, we're gonna opt out. In fact, 
Bobby Seale talked about a moment where he heard Martin Luther King Jr. speak. And Dr. King was talking about, I believe it's the Wonder Bread Company and how yep. they, they had a need for employment, but they wouldn't yep. hire black people. Yep. And Dr. King said, okay, look, we're gonna use market principles to resolve this. They're not hiring us, we're not consuming them. We're only gonna consume products from companies that signal to us that they actually care about us enough to let us come in there as workers and help make the products that we buy. And if you don't want us, we want you. We're taking our money elsewhere. And Bobby Seale said it was that power that really drew him to Dr. King because Dr. King wasn't interested in begging the Wonder Bread company to hire black folks. He was interested in voting with his dollars. And so these guys had a, and I, I shouldn't say these guys because in a relatively short amount of time, the majority of leadership in the Black Panther pa Panthers were women. And that doesn't get talked about enough, but these people had a had a deeper economic understanding than they often get credit for. And you can't just slap the label of anti-capitalist on them. You know, you, yep. if you go look at a Wikipedia entry, you'll see anti-capitalist or Marxist or socialist. And, and yeah, that, that's true when you dig into some of the particulars of the political philosophy, but there are a lot of things they agreed with that people who call themselves capitalists today would also advocate for, and that's free market accountability. Yeah, and I, I think that's just, you know, what I wanted to illustrate as well is that there are a lot of forms of capitalism um, and they are not created equal. Uh, and I think people often uh, lump uh, capitalism all together with with anything that's happening uh, in a capitalist society. And I think there are still a lot of wrongs and that one of the purest forms in 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 one of the things that are most in alignment with we talk about is free market um, and, and how free markets allow uh, people to make those kind of decisions, whether to support or to um, not support certain companies and and that that it is free in the sense that the consumer uh, has so much more buying power and so much more decision making uh, power than when governments are introduced and they artificially uh, can support or de defund certain organizations and, and I think they were a victim to that um, more than anyone was that uh, that they were very much in uh, in that process and I and I and, and, and just in the era of that and not to say that that era has seceded and that is no longer the case but you know it's just important to, to point out the differences um, in in definitions of capitalism and and how that manifests and how people are affected by that and it's easy to just label them as anti-capitalist without thinking about the whole picture but i also wanted uh to dive into they had a 10-point program for for what uh you know them as a party stood for and i wanted to read the 10 each each one of the points of the 10-point program um and again to to have a conversation that is intellectual, that is informed, um, you know, you, you really want to look at the whole picture and then decide for yourself, you know, were these people in alignment with your philosophy? Were, were some of it? Was all of it? Was none of it? But a lot of times, if we just let the mainstream conversation or the mainstream narrative tell the story, then you're going to think that they were crazy, that they were only out for bloodshed, um, you know, w whatever has been said about them, um, that's going to control the conversation. But to, 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 to give you more information to make your own de decisions and, and to see what resonates with you and what doesn't, here are the 10 points to the Black Panther Party program. So number one, we want freedom. We want power to determine the destiny of our Black community. Number two, we want full employment for our people. Number three, we want an end to the robbery by the capitalists of our black community. Number four, we want decent housing fit for the shelter of human beings. 
Number five, we want education for our people that exposes the true nature of this decadent American society. We want education that teaches us our true history and our role in the present day society. Number six, we want all black men to be exempt from the military service. Number seven, we want an immediate end to the police brutality and the murder of black people. Number eight, we want freedom for all black men held in state, county, city, um, and, and city prisons and jails. Number nine, we want all people, all black people, when brought to trial to be tried in a court by a jury of their peer group or people from their black communities as defined by in the, Constitution, in the Constitution of the United States. Number 10, we want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, and justice and peace. So, you know, to give a full perspective, I think there are things uh, that definitely can be learned and that should definitely change your perspective and definitely have changed my perspective of what this group was. Um, I think the the purpose of propaganda is to shape uh, the mass group of people and a lot of times to make them have an adverse reaction to a certain group that the people pushing the propaganda, a lot of times the government wants, you know, they want an adverse reaction uh, to this, to a certain thing, you know, that they're combating. And I think the Black Panthers were a recipient of, you know, negative propaganda that really painted them to be a militia more than a group that was advocating for the freedom of their community. But, you know, I, I think one of the ones, and there's a couple that stand out to me, but especially number can I, one. Can I, can know, I chime in real quick before you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. One, one, one thing I, I just want to say is that I, I, I want to send a strong signal to the people that are watching us that, um, I don't apologize for the decision to learn from everyone. There is a statement that often gets used. And that statement is, I don't agree with everything he says. Like you hear people say that when they recommend books or they recommend a podcast. Hey, go check out this Joe Rogan interview. I don't agree with everything he says. Hey man, go listen to, you know, Pastor Jake's talk about this topic. It's a really good interview. Now I don't agree with everything he says. I, I can understand why people say it, but for me, that's an assumption. If I recommend anything to any yes. of you, you should assume that I don't agree with everything that that person says, okay? I, I don't even agree with everything that TK Coleman said a year ago, because I'm always evolving, all right? I think it's worth spending time on the opposite statement as well, which is, I don't, I don't disagree with everything that he says. We should learn to say that about everybody. I don't disagree with everything that he says. Hey, here's this guy over here that I, that I dislike. He's a complete jerk, but I don't disagree with everything he says. I don't think he's wrong about everything. We need to have that ability in order to learn. We need to have that ability. And one of the reasons why we've talked a lot about cancel culture, and I know people see this in all different sorts of ways. And yes, I'm 100% on board with voluntary protests, voluntary rejection of products and all that kind of stuff. So I don't think making critiques of cancel culture using your right to free speech is in any way inconsistent with free market economics. But one of the reasons, one of the concerns I have about what gets called cancel culture is that it ignores the fact that every society is going to have heroes, that the next generation is going to find objectionable in some way. Because if each generation is truly evolving, or even de-evolving. Each generation is going to have values or sensitivities that the previous generation didn't have. And if we say, well, hey, one of the heroes from 20, 30 years ago had this imperfection and this flaw, so we're gonna say no one's allowed to study that person anymore. No one's allowed to read them. No one's allowed to learn something from them. No one is ever allowed to reference them without being persecuted for it. Then we lose the very possibility of learning from history because you may feel like you are in the position of power today to talk negatively about yesterday's heroes, but one day you're going to be gone and the next generation will get to decide what they think of you and your sensitivities. And some of those people from the future that we will never meet will look back upon us and they will say, yeah, but we're a different generation now and we don't like this aspect of that person. 
And so we're going to say, don't read them, don't quote them, or we're going to give you a hard time. And I just think that's nonsensical. And so when I take a look at history, I'm assuming I don't agree with everything they say, but I'm also assuming I don't disagree with everything they say. And what what is said about the Black Panthers, Black Panthers here, we should say that about everybody, because all of this stuff is true about your FBI. We're going to learn from this conversation here that the FBI, this is documented historical fact that they themselves conceded, engaged in unethical, illegal practices. And so does that mean you can't learn anything from the FBI? You know, so I mean, the institutions and individuals that we hold up as heroes in society or that we choose to learn from, they've all got these sorts of things that, you know, should make you say, I don't agree with everything they say. And they've all got virtues and insights that should make you say, I don't disagree with everything they say. I just wanted to get that out there because I think this should be said about everybody, not not just not just the group we're talking about today. No, for sure. I, I mean, what what is super clear because as TK illustrated about, I think his Curtis Austin, um, is that anytime you associate with your your name, your brand, uh, your ideas with a group like the Black Panther Party, anytime you even talk about them uh, for the sake of learning or for the sake of you know just inspecting like there there is negative propaganda there's so much negative propaganda that has been embedded in in their ideas and that identity that anytime you know you even step foot in that pond um you risk being seen in in a similar light um but i think as people who seek truth it is important to 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 understand and and to consume the full spectrum of ideas people you agree with and people you disagree with one of the things tk says a lot is that you know in terms of basketball um you know good game peeps all game meaning that if you are a good player um uh, that you don't just watch your own film you don't just watch people's film who is on your team you pay attention to people who play on a team who plays across the country from you you play you pay attention to players who play in a different continent of you you know you're not right. just confined to the ideas and the stylistic elements of you know the people's game who is in your immediate circle so i think through this conversation the purpose is to engage um ideas in a group in a movement who not only was uh eff effective and popular and you know controversial and all the things not only were they that during a different time period um but you know they they had such ideas uh that were so powerful for a reason that were so effective for a reason that were so controversial for a reason and they're there is things that can be learned uh, from a group that that stands for such. So, I mean, that that's kind of, it, it, it's an important piece whenever, especially because people are really sensitive to this group in particular, as are people with Malcolm X, you know, as are people, um, even with Martin Luther King, I think there, there are certain figures who, like Martin Luther King, have been painted in a really positive light for some of the things that he stood for. But the brother didn't get murdered for or assassinated for no reason. Like he he had controversial things. And I think there are just certain figures that maybe uh, the mainstream, a mainstream agenda was a lot easier to paint, uh, you know, that he was a nice figure. But he he still had revolutionary ideas and died a revolutionary death, as did these people folks um as did mlk um, as did other people that we want to talk about and you know the, the the entire purpose is is to expand your horizon of ideas to expand um you know your your understanding of what it means to create revolution and and i think what's really similar about this group and a lot of and a lot of other people and what where we stand is the fight for freedom and i think freedom first starts internally it starts uh with you knowing truth and you being in accordance uh with that truth but if you never put yourself in yeah. a position uh to engage with the truth even the 
even the ugly truth, then I think you don't put yourself in a position to live a life of freedom and inner freedom. Um, so that, that's the purpose. I, I, I hope that wasn't missed. Um, and, 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 you know, that's, that's always our goal when, when we're approaching these things that the, the very first value is that they wanted freedom, that we want freedom. We want, uh, the power yeah. to determine the destiny of our black community. Um, and I think a lot of people can relate with the desire for freedom. Um, now, the ways that they went about approaching it, I think, are different from, you know, maybe the way that we go about approaching it in the way that we suggest going about approaching it. But nonetheless, you know, this narrative of of freedom and and while why that is so fundamental and important uh, shouldn't be overlooked. Hey, I, I like to talk about some of the ways uh, that I do support, ways they went about fighting for freedom that I think were really awesome, really good, and that I love to see more of today. Um, Go for it. Malcolm X said, of all our studies, history will most reward our, our research. And that, that proves to be true in, in studying the Black Panthers here. So there were a few things they did. One of the, one of the things that Huey P. Newton, co-founder, talked a lot about was what he called survivor or survival programs that were designed to help people sustain um, a, a decent quality of life and provide the foundation for growth. His philosophy was that people can't focus on progress and personal development if they are too busy being worried about what they're going to eat or, or how they're going to pay rent or even staying healthy. Because, you know, when you're sick and you're dying, all you can think about is being sick and dying. And, 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 you know, you don't really think about reading books or developing a new skill. And so he wanted to focus on the, the essentials of survival. And one of the observations they made is that um, in the schools, a lot of the, the black kids were performing under par. And the reason being is because they came from poor homes that couldn't afford breakfast and these kids weren't eating. They were coming to school hungry and they were just distracted. And so the Black Panthers started what was called a breakfast program in, in, in Oakland. And what they would do is they would go to grocers. They wouldn't shake them down. They wouldn't walk in there with guns and threaten them. They wouldn't use coercion. They didn't write a letter to the senator and wait for a politician to feel like I advocate for your cause. They went to these grocers, white grocers, by the way, and told them about what they wanted to do for children. And the white grocers donated food. And the Black Panthers, they volunteered. They, they, they recruited people from the community to volunteer. And they would cook breakfast every morning. They would have a sign that says, on school days, breakfast every day. And they would feed the children breakfast. And you started to see the performance of those children get better. These guys identified, not guys again, mostly women were in positions of leadership after a short amount of time. But they identified problems like that and took a voluntarist approach, whether they had ever heard of voluntarism or agree with it or not, they took that non-coercive, creative approach to dealing with problems in the community. And that wasn't it alone. They taught courses on economics. You know, they taught courses on self-defense. They recruited medical staff to be volunteers and to do sickle cell testing, to provide treatment for various ailments and so on. And you contrast that with the world we live in today, where we see a problem, it's almost like we kind of lack vocabulary for how we could do something about it. We almost see it as bad to encourage people to think in these directions. I don't know, if, I think you saw this clip, the young brother that was on the Roland Martin show and he started the school and mm -hmm. the whole time Roland Martin was just drilling the guy. And I, I've enjoyed several of Roland Martin's episodes, but I think Roland Martin might have been reacting more to the perceived political implication of what this young brother was saying, rather than celebrating the power of what he was doing. This was a young guy, I believe he's 20 or 21, who went out and raised the money, recruited the help to start a school for, for young black children to help them be able to think more in a more economically, entrepreneurially sound manner and he said that his whole premise is, I'm not going to wait for someone else to save us. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to I'm going to do something about it myself. 
And that was something that the Black Panthers were about. And I, and I absolutely agree with, at least with these survival programs, you saw this mindset of people that said, hey, we're gonna serve our community and make the people in our community healthier and more educated. We're not gonna wait for a politician to do it. We're gonna use nonviolent creativity and make our own communities better. I'd love to see more of that today, rather than people just being angry, people just protesting, and people just waiting to get the wrong guy out of office and the wrong guy in office. There's so much more to human potential than that. Yeah, and I think why they were received so positively am amongst the community is because I think up until that point, um, a lot of Black folks, you know, post-slavery, uh, were not depicted obviously in in positive lights and so you know the confidence the self-worth the self-respect uh that black people were being shown um you know was not an empowering one and i think that they were very unique in the way that they portrayed and promoted uh these self-portraits of, of black people, you know, uh, one of the things that they were really uh, well known for was their paper that, you know, they didn't have chapters all around the country, but they did sell papers. And those papers, um, you know, went to all of the cities, um, at least all of the major cities in the United States. And again, even though some of these groups were centralized, they really had um, a positive impact in trying to empower people um, and they showed people who looked like them who showed other black people as heroes uh, and and i think that really just changed it and it, it empowered people in a way that you know previously uh they had never felt before and you know th that that's so important you know we talk about uh, freedom. We talk about, you know, taking personal responsibility. We talk about all of these uh, important aspects to uh, realizing, you know, your potential, realizing your inner freedom, et cetera, et cetera. And, and for us, it starts with, it's, an, it's a message of empowering. I think a lot of people think of uh, self-help and they think of it maybe only in the sense of, you know, realizing your best business practices, you know, maybe making yourself more productive. Um, but I think, you know, the, the reason that people swear by self-help, the reason uh, that it's helped many different people turn their lives around is because it, it places seeds of faith, it places seeds of hope, it places seeds of the future in people's perspective and worldview and allows them to see something that is bigger than where they're currently at. And I think that's the importance of empowering messages and especially empowering messages of freedom. I think we often talk about on this show, you know, there's a lot of times where they can restrict your body, uh, they can restrict you physically. They can, they may, they may be able to restrict you financially, but um, I think true freedom is, is, is inner, you know, people in jail, there's no reason uh, that they would be able to come out and, and, and find hope and, and start a new life if they didn't have something, some inner freedom that they've, that help liberate their minds. And if, if you allow your circumstances and a lot of times, uh, for, 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 for black folks in America, you know, circumstances seem to be damned, but if you allow that to be the thing that writes your future, I mean, then you, then, you know, you are damned, but the, the purpose of empowering messages is to suggest otherwise is to illustrate otherwise is to highlight that it is possible that there are ways, um, that take you, you know, you re you 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 taking re responsibility and and you being about what you say you want to be about um but that often that message isn't often preached that the message um a lot of times is you know this is kind of what it is it is what it is you know like just be okay with suffering just be okay uh with the mm. reality i think that this group was not okay with that um that that they saw more um, and they wanted to take those outlying and, you know, rare cases, and they wanted to showcase it to the, the, the rest of the people saying, as a people, you are capable of this. Yeah, 100%, man. And 
from Bobby Seale to Eldridge Cleaver to Huey P. Newton to um, Fred Hampton, these guys were all relatively young. And they were out there motivating people, building people up, many of whom were older than them, you know? <laughs> and I, I mean, it's just astounding because I, I think about my life and I think about personal development and I see myself just being on this journey of, of, of just trying to become a better human being, trying to become a person that lives up to the ideals I set. And these guys didn't really have the luxury of looking at that as a long journey. I even remember in the, in the, the uh, Fred Hampton speech that we, we played at the beginning, he said that he suspects that one day he's gonna die. And, and he didn't expect to really live for a long time. He expected that he would probably have to give his life for that cause. And so they didn't have this, this luxury of thinking about what they're gonna be doing when they're 60, 70, 80. You know, Bobby Seale is still alive today, I believe in his 80s, but Fred Hampton died in his 20s. And so th there's something to be said too about having, having a sense of urgency. We often think our, lot, like, our lives would be better if everything were easy. But easier doesn't always equal better. Easier doesn't always bring out the best in you. That doesn't mean you justify the difficulties that are in your life unjustly, but you embrace them as opportunities to grow. And to, to speak back to what you were saying about the, the personal development and the way, the way it's kind of oversimplified, I think there are two ways to, to deal with, with um, unfairness, injustice, and evil. One is you deal with it through confrontation. You look at it in the face, you challenge it, and you say, this is wrong. I'm not going to go away. I'm not going to be politically correct. This is wrong. We need to change things. Let's do yeah. the work. Yeah. I think this generation is getting really good at that. I think we live in a world, especially with social media, giving us the opportunity to have a voice, especially through anonymous accounts where we don't have to pay traditional social costs for the things that we say and believe. I believe that people are very good at that. But the second dimension, this is what Black Panthers were good at, even though they only get credit for the confrontational side. The second dimension is the creative side, the side that says, no matter how much I confront evil, I must also acknowledge that there will always be evil in my lifetime. And I have to use creativity in order to innovate around the systems of oppression. I've got to use creativity in order to innovate around the people that don't play the game of life fairly. And I think these survival programs were a great illustration of that, where they were constantly confronting evil and they were challenging the political system as well to include black folks uh, in their concept of individual rights. But while they were confronting, they were also creating and saying, while we fight that slow, arduous battle, we're also going to make the things happen ourselves, even if it's a little less than our ideal. And to me, that's what the spirit of self-help is. That's what it's all about. Man, yeah, let's talk that. about just because with the limited time we have, I, I do want to talk about what went wrong. And I want to talk about the, the downfall, yeah. you know. Uh, Langston Hughes says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, man. Um, no, that's a, that's a proverb. A proverb. The, the the book of Proverbs says, "Hope deferred makes the the heart sick," and it was Langston Hughes who wrote the the beautiful poem, "A Dream Deferred." But um, man, it, it's so sad studying the Black Panthers because they had their finger on the pulse of so much. There, there were so many ways in which they were moving the needle and instilling instilling confidence and growth in the community, but. There were also so many things that went wrong that kind of shattered the dream, that kind of derailed the vision. And I, I like to, to yeah. get into that a little bit. So the optics at the time, I'm just going to read a few things here. J just sure. the optics at, at the time, because we're, we're talking about all the positive, awesome things they did, but those were not the optics. There, there, were a lot of controver there was a lot of controversy. So in 1967, the Mulford Act was passed by the California legislator, signed by Governor Ronald Reagan. The bill was crafted in response to members of the Black Panther Party who were cop watching. The bill repealed a law that allowed the public carrying of loaded firearms. So the passing of this bill was a concession that 
they really did know the law. They were practicing the law. And these cop watch programs were simply them exercising their rights and they were having an impact. But people were complaining that it was intimidating. So it was interesting, right? Like the uh, the whole gun rights thing, people people were very uncomfortable when, when black folks were exercising their rights to bear arms. That's an interesting thing. Um, we still got to get uh, Mosh Ture uh, <laughs> on here to talk about Black Guns Matter. But um, in 1968, Federal Bureau of Investigation Director uh, J. Edgar Hoover described the party as the greatest threat to the internal security of the country. And so these guys were looked at, the, or, or rather the Black Panthers were looked at so negatively that the law-abiding practices were illegalized after the fact in order to prevent it from happening anymore. Yeah. And then when J. Edgar Hoover says they're the biggest threat to this country's security, um, things started to, to go in a really downward direction where there was really no room for error, no room for misstep, no room for misspeak. And there, and there was some misstep and misspeak, and every bit of it cost the Panthers. So I'm, I'm going to pause here. Say also, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I de definitely want to say also is that J. Everett, Edgar Hoover um, had made his business. Um, I'm not exactly sure what year and, and how long the Black Panthers had be, had been rolling, but he made it his business uh, to, you know, to repress the Black Panther Party. But once once Nixon, President Nixon got elected um, and and, you know, it was very clear that the agenda was to to snuff this out. Uh, I think it really enabled uh, J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI, I mean, to hold no bars when it came to destroying uh, the Black Panther Party. Yeah. You know, wh wh whatever that looked like, whether it was infiltration, um, neutralization, you know, anything that they could do. This is kind of where lines get foggy, real foggy in terms of what was morally collect correct what was law abiding um you know the goal was just to destroy uh the party and and to prevent having a black messiah which i think uh you know there there were a few few of the leaders there was Huey P. Newton who was the founder of you know the black panther party he was kind of the visionary um there was Bobby Seal he was more of the diplomatic kind of uh, personality um, there was Eldridge Cleaver, uh, and those three were kind of the first early figures of <coughs> the Black uh, Panther Party. And then later on, Fred Hampton came along uh, when Bobby Seale was wrongfully indicted and held in court. And that was uh, the clip that you saw at the beginning of the episode. And so um, I'll let kind of TK talk to this, but it, it gets real foggy in terms of, um, you know, the FBI's main goal and and how far they were willing to go to achieve it. Yeah, there there was so many there were so many ru rumors, so many criminal charges, so many arrests, so many legal hurdles to to overcome and and there there was a lot of smoke and mirrors enshrouding everything to where it just leaves you confused what in the world was going on. Um so let's talk a little bit about Cointel Pro. And I'm, I'm going to read to you something here. Just CoinTelPro was a series of covert and illegal projects conducted by the United States Federal Bureau of Investigation aimed at surveying, infiltrating, discrediting, and disrupting domestic American political organizations. FBI records show CoinTelPro resources targeted groups and individuals the FBI deemed subversive. And there was a lot of shady stuff that went on via this CoinTelPro uh, program. And just to make it clear, nothing that I'm saying here is is something that isn't even acknowledged in, um, in the mainstream. It's all open information at this point. Um, after the fact, though, after the fact, right? Um, at, at the time, if you were saying this, you probably would have been called a conspiracy theorist. But I, I was reading uh, earlier today, uh, there was a New York Times article that uh, is titled, FBI admits planting a rumor to discredit Gene Seberg in 1970. Um, th this was um, um, a, a plot in 1970 to kind of damage the reputation of Jean Seberg. She was an actress who committed suicide 
Uh, and what they did was they planted a rumor with news organizations that she was pregnant by a high ranking member of the Black Panther Party. There were a number of things like this that they did because the goal was to sow discord. Um, in, in Judas and the Black Messiah, you see how they did this with one particular aspect, but that's just one. You see how they did this with William O'Neill. He actually tells his story in the Vanguard of the Revolution, how uh, they got him on a charge. It had nothing to do with the Black Panthers. And they basically said, hey, look, you know, you can, you can go the traditional way and get punished for your crime, or we can let you go and you work for us. And they basically um, used him as an informant in the Black Panthers and, 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 and wanted him to rise up into the ranks so that he can be closest to Fred Hampton. Uh, and unbeknownst to Fred Hampton, you know, this guy had access to just knowledge of where he lived, how to move about in, in his living space, and played a critical role in, in the assassination of, of Fred Hampton. And um, I, I do say assassination with this one because, again, if you were living at the time, you probably would have been called a conspiracy theorist. For saying these things but after the fact um there was a civil lawsuit that was filed um you, you know so, so just to back up a little bit there was a raid in fred hampton's house which resulted in him being shot to death and the narrative you know was one that tried to make it look understandable tried to make it look like he was the one that initiated fire um but that turned out to not be true there was a civil lawsuit uh, fi you know filed on behalf of the survivors resolved in 1982 a settlement of $1.85 million. The city of Chicago, Cook County, federal government, each pay one third to a group of nine plaintiffs. And, and because of the revelations that came out about COINTELPRO, um, most scholars now consider his, uh, his death to be an assassination. But acts of infiltration like this, uh, the, the seeds of discord court between Huey Newton and Eldridge Cleaver, resulted in a separation of the group. It was divided in half. Um, there were a number of sketchy arrests that were undermined through a lot of activism, but it took a lot of the finances. Um, it took a lot of the wind out of the sails. I mean, if, if someone is just constantly arresting you, jailing you, putting you in the position of having to fight and protest to get out, um, after a while, it just makes it too expensive to keep going to court and fighting for your freedom. There were lots of people that eventually got intimidated. They didn't want to join the Panthers anymore because they were afraid, oh my gosh, like somebody's gonna arrest me. And so things just eventually lost momentum as people are either getting arrested or getting killed. And the people on the outside watching this, they're either believing the, the demonizing reports or they're just scared for their own lives. Um, and we see what started out as a, as a very powerful influential movement is one that um, one that just kind of teeters out, and 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 that's not to say that it was all about infiltration. There there, there are you know, former members yeah. of the Black Panthers, yeah, yeah, who, I, who actually I disagree. To that yep, yep, definitely, yeah. definitely. I wanted to speak to that aspect because I think it's easy to perceive, uh, you know, the way that we're explaining the situations as that the Black Panther parties were the sole victim, and that nothing was done on uh, their behalf to contribute to the downfall of the organization. But um, that that isn't the case. And, and, and through a lot of the stories that are told, you know, one of the things that particularly stood out to me um, was this note I made uh, that other members of the Black pa Panther Party were articulated after, like upon reflecting on what had happened. And one of the notes I made here was escalating the rhetoric was the fuel that helped the party grow in popularity, but was also a destructive force because it was constantly upping the ante. And at that point, yeah. the party was pretty much at war um, with the police and, and, and not only at war physically um, in, in terms of violence, but at war um you know, publicly, like just very, very publicly denouncing and attacking and, you know, uh, mimicking and, you know, intimidating all the things, you know. Uh, and I think, you know, parts of it were in retaliation, which were, you know, a according to their principles and, and, you know, in line with their whole 
approach to being Panthers and, and, and being this retaliating force. But a part of it was also rhetoric um, that that was very viral, which is kind of a word we use nowadays. But I think the same principle applies. You know, you see people on social media. I mean, they say all kinds of craziness because they know that's the thing that's going to get the hits. That's the thing that's going to get more of the right. public eye. That's the thing that, you know, gets them more followers. And that the things that they say might not even be truly who their character is and, and really in line with the values that they stand for. But they know that that is the stuff that circulates. And so I think that was really prevalent in, in the Black Panther Party was that a lot of uh, the aggressive rhetoric helped the party grow nationwide in popularity. But it was also a destructive force because it kept upping the ante, meaning like the stakes are higher and higher and higher. And like there's more pressure on them from external forces that want to see their downfall. Um, and, and by upping that ante, I mean, you know, it, it you're just creating um, such fertile environment for, uh, you know, all of the, the assassinations and all, all of the discord that was happening. Yeah, man. And, 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 and one of the things I love so much about the Vanguard of the Revolution documentary, and I'm not putting all the pressure on this one to say they got everything right, is that you do have criticisms of the Black Panthers from the Black Panthers themselves, right? Not, not everybody looked at Huey P. Newton as smart and as visionary as he was as a great guy. There are a lot of criticisms that were made of him. Um, there, there are a number of criticisms made of Eldridge Cleaver. You know, did he make the right decision by fleeing and going to a different country? Or should he have stayed and addressed things there? Or was his rhetoric too strong? Did he, you know, align himself with, with the right people? There's lots of room for criticism there. And um, it, it's one of those things, man, where this, this, is, this is kind of a tough one to talk about because on one end, when you are under a microscope, you've got to be careful with how you speak. Like, like, you, like you've got to know when you're in a season of needing attention and when you're in a mm. season of needing the attention to not be on you. And when the Black Panthers first started, they needed attention. They needed to adopt a rhetoric that would sh send a strong signal to the people they wanted to reach and, and send a strong signal to the allies they wanted to have. And that really contributed a lot to their growth. But you wonder if at some point there was a need to say, all right, we've sent out those signals and we have our allies and we have our people, but maybe we need to start doing some things that are a little bit less attracting of the spotlight. I don't, I, I don't know what the right answer is about that. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I haven't done enough research on this to feel comfortable saying what I think they could have or should have done in terms of, um, responded to being on the microscope. But that's one of the questions that I'm asking, because like you said, a lot of the speech escalated at a time when they were just giving away perfect excuses for for um, the people that were already threatened by them to be threatened. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's kind of tough. In, in the name of time, I wanna do a couple of things. First, I wanna recommend some resources for people to go check out. If this topic is new to you and you and you want to learn, I want us both to do that because I don't talk about any of this stuff from the vantage point of I am the leading scholar on it. I'm a student alongside everybody else, and I am still learning about all of these things. I have a lot to learn about history in particular, I mean, in general, and my history in particular. So um, I would definitely recommend people check out um, the writings and the talks of Curtis Austin. Before you buy a book and you just kind of want to preview warm up, he's got more than just that TED talk. That's a very short, very brief introductory talk, but he's got a number of talks that are, are longer than 45 minutes. And he says a lot of interesting things about the Panthers that provide great historical context. I would encourage you to check out his writings and his book. Also, the, the Huey P. Newton Foundation, which was founded by uh, Huey P. Newton's uh, wife. and um, she is, is, is attempting to preserve the historical legacy and talk about their ideals, um, talk about the art, talk about the mission and, and, and the, the various philosophies. Um, and th there's even a museum that you can check out. 
um, I would encourage you to check out not only the Vanguard of the Revolution, but for some entertainment with a little bit of history, you know, and you got to take it with a grain of salt. Um, you not only have Judas and the Black Messiah, but you've got the 1995 movie Panther um, and then the uh, the Spike Lee documentary on Huey P. Newton that um, Kamal referenced earlier. Um, anything you want to throw in there, man? No, I, I think those are um, good good resources. I, I There's one last point that I, I wanted to make, um, and, and we talked about this in you know, our inquiry into radical mass movements that I think there is something about joining any particular group, whether they stand for, uh, that it's, a, it's an important position to hold your individuality first, because there, 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 to me, there becomes a point where there is um, a self-sabotaging approach to, to groups that it's important to, to realize when something is in accordance with what your values are and then when it is not and knowing where you stand on that. Because there was a lot of times where, um, you know, I think the lines of the members, because of their, you know, just allegiance and, and loyalty that they allowed themselves um, to get looped into something that they might have not initially thought they signed up for. And it, it, it's just yeah. important to, to, to look at these revolutionary movements and see the strengths, the weaknesses, the beauty and the ugly, and to know that you can learn something by this um, and, and allow it to influence you, but you can also learn uh, and, and allow this stuff to position your own individuality and your own uh, revolutionary mindset for the sake of you. That isn't for the sake of just a group, um, but is, is for the sake of you. And so, you know, it, it, when you look at groups like this and, and you see how radical they get, it is because uh, people um, have lost that sense of identity and lost, you know, maybe the reasons that they signed up for and, and, and just, yeah, got, got so absorbed in the group identity versus, you know, what they individually stood for. Um, there are obviously people who do individually stand for 10 toes down, you know, certain causes, but I would just, you know, ex suggest and express um, to, to people listening, watching that before you dive headfirst into any support of anything, that it's just important that you're doing it for the reasons that are in alignment with you and, and not for anything else. Yeah, man, word up. I, I want to I want to close with four quotes from from uh, Fred Hampton, because I, I, I like to study everything through the framework of what can I learn from this? What can we learn from this? How can we draw from the insights of the people that we're studying to um, to live more freely and fully in our own individual lives? And so I'm, I'm going to go through four lessons and 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 let's let's go back and forth. I'll, I'll I'll riff on one, you 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 riff on two, I'll riff on three, you you can riff on four. Um, so let, let's go with lesson one. I'll, I'll I'll give you the quote and then I will um, give give a succinct statement of the lesson here. All right, the lesson here is freedom takes sacrifice and effort. From Fred Hampton, you have to understand that people have to pay a price for peace. If you dare to struggle, you dare to win. Mm. Kamau and I have often talked here about the difference between a passion and a preference. A preference is something that you want. A passion is something that you're willing to make sacrifices in order to obtain. Your life will not be a reflection of your preferences. It will only be a reflection of your passions. What are you willing to commit to? What are you willing to work hard for? What are you willing to struggle for? It's not about what you complain about. It's what you're willing to show up and create even when times are hard. Lesson number two. Freedom begins with the mind. Another quote from Fred Hampton here. You can't build a revelation with no education. Yomo Kenyatta did this in Africa and because the people were not educated, he became as much an oppressor as the people he overthrew. Yeah, I, I think we talked about this a little bit earlier that in education is is really the source of freedom, um, that it starts with uh, education and that, you know, your ability to self self educate outside of what somebody is telling you um, is is 
going to be the thing that allows you to find inner freedom and inner truth. I love it. Lesson number three. This one is get creative. The Black Panther Party stood up and said that we don't care what anybody says. We don't think fighting fire with fire is best. We think you fight fire with water best. Whenever you are dealing with a problem and it feels like your condition is hopeless, it feels like you have run out of options, never ever accept that as the final answer. Not because it isn't positive enough, but because it isn't rational enough. It assumes that you know more about the universe and its possibilities than you actually do. Have you read all the books there are to read? Have you watched all the talks there are to watch? Have you listened to all the podcasts there are to listen to? Have you spoken with all the people that there are to learn from? No, none of us have. There are always more possible solutions than what our education has provided us with the knowledge of. And so that means whenever you run up against a problem, there is at least one idea, probably millions of them, millions of ways of approaching it that you've never heard of, that you've never been exposed to. Be open to that, be willing to learn. And when you have problems, get curious about them because when you're curious, that's when you can become creative. Let's go to lesson four. This is the final one. And the lesson here is be willing to work with anyone. Another Fred Hampton quote. We say that we will work with anybody and form a coalition with anybody that has revolution on their mind. Yeah, I, I think this is really just an illustration to their power, to the power of leaders like Malcolm X, to the power like leaders like MLK. Um, to the power that leaders are able to unite people um, amongst common causes that advocate for you know individual prosperity um, and individual freedom, I think you know that's when you're most effective. It, you, the Black Panther Party, um, and a specific, we'll go with specifically Fred Hampton, um, was most effective and and was the biggest the, the biggest threat. Uh, once he was able to unite with groups that weren't just black, there were people outside of that community um, that were people who who really stood for the same causes. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, w when you put yourself in a position that you're you're serving people based off of truth and based off of, uh, you know, messages that that are empowering i think it goes beyond race i think it goes beyond color it really comes down to values um and it, it comes down to, to to shared values and so you know that that's what this says to me is that you know true power comes from truth uh and it, and, and truth you know knows no limits yeah you know in closing i think about one moment that really gripped me was uh, i believe it was after the death of Fred Hammond, Fred Hampton, not Fred Hammond, Fred Hammond is the gospel musician um, and he's still with us. But after the death of Fr the murder of Fred Hampton, um, there was a strong sense of we got to do something. And there was one guy who told the story of um, like his younger brother coming to him and being like, you know, can I get a gun? And uh, he gave him a gun, you know, thinking that he's going to use it in self-defense and said, you know, just look out for yourself and be safe out there. And there was an older Panther who who wanted to get other people to go along with him and say, hey, we need to take some guns and go send out a strong message. And there was disagreement in the community. Most people, most of the older people did not want to go along with that. They didn't think that was a smart move. But he got, got some younger guys to go along with them. And they gave their lives in an effort to submit, um, in an effort to send a strong message, in an eff effort to retaliate. And it was a tragic moment because lives were lost and the movement was hurt by what happened because it, it, it put a really big spotlight on the movement and it made it much easier to demonize the movement with the narrative of this is a pro-violent terrorist organization, made it easier to say that. And it just makes me think about anger today when we see injustice when we see evil 
when we see things that break our hearts and hurt us. The, I won't even say the easiest thing to do, but it's it, a, a tempting thing to do is to say, let me retaliate in the first way that comes to my mind so that I can send out a strong message to people that lets them know I'm not the one to mess with. And I think we all have moments like that. And the manner in which we're tempted to retaliate might vary from person to person. It don't even always come down to violence. And what I wanna encourage everybody out there to do who wants to be an individual revolutionary for freedom, for the non-violent, non-coercive way, um, is when you have those moments, keep the mission in mind and, and ask yourself, not only what will bring me relief in this moment, but what's gonna allow me to build a legacy that will help me change more lives next year, a decade from now, a hundred years from now. I dare not assume that if I were a part of the Panthers back then, that I would have been the brilliant guy coming up with ideas for how the organization could have most effectively achieved its goals. But what I can be is a person who strives to live for a legacy that can endure my life and that can go beyond my lifetime. And the best way to do that is to always try to think how can I approach things strategically and how can I harness my anger in a constructive and creative way? If you feel angry at things that, that are going on in the world, keep that anger. Bible says be angry and sin not and figure out how can you use that anger to build other people up rather than to tear something down that's going to just put a target on your back and destroy the mission. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed the discussion. We look forward to more conversations about historical figures, things that we can learn from them, their successes and their failures. Please hit the like button. Please hit the subscribe. Let us know in the comments if you have any questions or feedback. And uh, we'll see you next time. Cheers, everybody.